Are we? <laughs> there now. I I uh, thank all of you this evening, my friends, brothers and sisters, family and uh, family members that I haven't yet gotten acquainted with even. I uh, appreciate that all of you are joining us on the Book of Mormon Perspectives Forum this evening to hear the presentation by Dr. Ron Smith. It is, uh, uh, it is my privilege to continue the scramble sometimes because things don't always work out the way that you initially schedule them. And uh, for next week, we had scheduled Paul and Dee Ludi, and they've asked to be moved into September. And so next week, uh, we're going to try something a little different and I'm planning to play teacher and host a discussion on the nature of truth. I'm sure that uh, that you will all have vantage points to share, but it'll be fun fundamentally. Well, I do have a presentation on uh, on a few perspectives to to share, but then it'll fundamentally be an open forum for discussion on the nature of truth. And so I invite you to think about that in advance. And then, following that, we get back into our normal pattern uh, with uh, Josh Gailey coming. And uh, he'll be he'll be coming on August. Let's see, that's August 16. And then August 23, we have Wanda Sweet. Stubbert, and uh, we're still needing a couple of gentlemen that will that will participate in her uh, book of her uh, radio reading. And uh, well, I keep setting out the schedule, uh, and so I'll I'll do that again without further ado, because I want to proceed with, with the introduction of our guest this evening. And let me move that to screen share so that uh, we can have that part as available. <clears throat> looks good, Paul. Whoop. Did I move it out now? Yep, looks good. Okay, wait a minute. Well, uh, there. Now do we have him? Uh, we had his picture, and then it switched to something else. All right, let's try again. I think maybe I, I moved him off, and then, then put it back on. Yep. There we go. Yeah. You get, you've got him. All right. Um, let's admit that person. All right, Dr. Ron Smith is our guest this evening. He has a PhD in math, and uh, he has previously presented on the Book of Mormon Perspectives Forum. In August, our very first session, he presented on Isaiah and the Book of Mormon. In December, he shared about Christmas and the Book of Mormon. In February, he gave us a, a fractal approach to the Book of Mormon. And tonight, he is uh, inviting us to consider the, or to, to invite the real Anton Trask transcript to stand up. Um, we have heard previously from Faye Shaw and uh, Mary Jo Yickel on the characters. Uh, they put together a, a, a characters book this last year. We have had uh, Blair Bryant's testimony of inspiration about the characters. We've been referred to the uh, translation by Jerry Cooper. And so it appears that we're at, we're uh, in time for another perspective on reading from from Ron Smith, and so thank you, Ron, for sharing with us. We're still getting quite a few people entering, and that's fine. So let me hit the admin for this one, and then let us pray. Lord of the heavens, the earth, the elements, and all forms of life and its beauty. We gather this evening appreciative of your work calling us to higher duty, to live within your multiverse, bringing honor to your name, acting and reacting in virtuous manner to provide your appropriate acclaim. As we look upon nature, the beautiful reality you have made, we recognize that we often measure up, we do not quite make the grade. Yet you offer us some latitude. You forgive and give us a new dawn to see the light. 
and provide photons through the light years and the stars guiding us through the night. This evening, we seek enlightenment about the characters in a challenging, mysterious script. And we are well aware that you want to communicate with us in ways in which we are equipped. Your words are important to us. So help us understand the deeper meanings behind the words and the actions of your hand. Bless our presenter, Ron Smith, who has come back home from Africa to share. Bless his endeavors, his outreach and love, his compassion and his care. May the spirit of understanding be with us as we contemplate the mysteries that confront us in our limited dimension state. And may we find some agreement in the sharing of our views as we examine varied perspectives in the subjects we peruse. Let us mutually share the appreciation of beauty. Let us respond favorably to your call to duty, to love you and each other as we meet as sister and brother seeking to understand. Amen. Ron, I'll put the, stop, the share stop mm -hmm. on and the floor is yours for your presentation. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you for allowing me to be here again. Um, it's, nice, it's nice to be back home. Um, had a little excitement on the Turkish air flight from, from Istanbul to Chicago. We uh, pulled into the gate in Chicago and um, the captain came on the air and he said, uh, we have a little electrical problem in the, uh, in the cabin and uh, we need to get the, uh, uh, have, a, have an external electrical uh, source so that we can shut the, uh, shut the, uh, shut the engines off. <laughs> It'll be about five minutes. And about an hour later, we got off the plane. So it was, it was interesting, <laughs> but uh, I'm here. And, um, and I hope that uh, you'll find, you know, this is, this is not a deep theological uh, uh, presentation by any stretch of the imagination, but I hope that uh, you'll, you'll find it enjoyable um, to, at least, to at least listen to. So I'm going to share my screen here. And... Um, And we'll get started. So, the uh, the name of my presentation is "Will the Real Anton Transcript Please Stand Up?" Um, this is a photograph of Martin Harris, and it was the only one that I could really find. Um, we don't have ones when he was young young man because photography wasn't really around very much then. And uh, so we have one from his old age. But uh, most of you are familiar with this story. You can find it in the church history. Um, sometime in the month of February, 1828, Mr. Martin Harris came to our place. This is Joseph Smith's writing. Got the characters which I had drawn off the plates and started with them to the city of New York. Harris presented the characters which had been translated with the translation thereof to Professor Anton, a gentleman celebrated for his literary attainments. Professor Anton stated that the translation was correct. He said they were Egyptian, Chaldaic, Assyriac, and Arabic, and he said that they were the true characters. Through the years, a variety of sources have claimed to contain these characters. And um, I've, I've pictured all of the ones that I know about here. I was surprised to find there were so many. Um, but we're going to uh, carefully compare all of these sources and it yields some interesting clues regarding their relationships and their origins. The first two that I'm going to take are what we're, I'm going to call Whitmer and, and Hicks. This, are the, uh, this is 
the Whitmer characters are the Anton transcript of church history. Uh, when you read our, our history, it's, it calls this the Anton transcript, that which uh, Martin Harris took to, um, took to New York. Uh, the title characters, the, the people that um, have studied the handwriting say that this is either John or Christian Whitmer's handwriting. Um, I'll say it's John. Most, most of the people say it's John's. Um, that's fine with me. The, the characters on top, um, we, the RLDS church purchased these from the Whitmer family in the 1890s, along with a number of other uh, things, including the Book of Mormon um, manus manuscript, the printer's manuscript. Uh, they're currently housed in the Community of Christ archives. Here's uh, the oldest known photograph of the Whitmer characters. There are other photographs. Um, this particular one is a 19th century photo by Jacob Hicks, who was the first professional photographer in Clay and Ray counties, Missouri, according to the museum that's, dis that's displaying it. This was posted online by the Clay County Museum in 2009. And you'll notice that it has um, the characters uh, that the Whitmer has, plus some extra paper on it that uh, isn't, isn't now available. The next two that we're going to look at are the prophet and the stick of Joseph and a printing error. There was a church newspaper in New York. It was started in 1844. And, uh, and ended in 1845. 1844, of course, was when Joseph was killed. This was run by Samuel Brannan and William Smith. Samuel Brannan uh, is uh, the one from the California Gold Rush Sutter's Mill fame. And William Smith was uh, Joseph's brother. On December 21st, 1844, there was an article that appeared in the paper. You can see pieces of the article um, around there just a little bit. And then you have these, uh, these three lines of characters uh, printed vertically here. If you rotate them 90 degrees, you can see that the prophet is a printed copy of the first three rows of Whitmer. And when I say it's a printed copy, uh, here's what I mean. Now, I could, I could have started at the beginning and done all three rows, but I'm just going to do the third row here. Um, you will see differences in the individual characters. Um, the, the, one, the, the one that's on the left in the gray is from the Whitmer, and the one that's in, on the right is the character from the, um, from the prophet. And you'll notice that the prophet doesn't have this uh, distinct dot beside it, but it's about, it's the same kind of character here. And as we go across, you'll notice that the characters are recognizable and they're in the exact same sequence. Okay, so here we have three of them so that we can hurry along a little bit. Uh, again, some, some variation in them, but certainly uh, the, the same sequence of characters. And if you, if you want me to go slower or something, just, just let me know. I can't see your faces, so you'll have to, you'll have to uh, break in and, and say something. Um, these, are, these are clearly, this is clearly the same sequence of, of characters all the way. And, it, it, and all three rows are that way, which is why I say that the, the, the prophet is a, is a copy of the, um, of the characters on the uh, Whitmer. Um, the stick of Joseph was an advertisement. Um, they call it a broadside in some of the uh, literature about it. Uh, a broadside is a, is a piece of paper that's printed on one side and was used for an advertisement. So this is the sort of thing that you would stick onto a wall or a telephone pole or something to advertise something. 
And um, this was an advertisement for the Book of Mormon. It was published by the prophet. That is, it was printed in the same, same place. Uh, and it original, the originals have gold lettering on black paper. And here's a, a modern recolored version that shows the, the three lines of characters that are in the stick of Joseph. Now, it's important to realize that every page that was printed in 1844 had to be typeset by hand. And any artwork that was done was done by an engraver who transferred the art backwards onto a copper or wood block and carved out the excess. So, so here I've got a, a, a modern version of things and you can see the, th the three here is backwards and uh, they've carved out the excess. So that will print off a three when it's pressed onto a piece of paper. And if you compare the stick of Joseph and the prof prophet you will see that character by character, they are exactly the same, except for one small detail. And when I say exactly the same, what I mean is that you can, I, I was absolutely astounded that I could do this. Uh, I took the, uh, uh, the characters off of, off of the um, stick of Joseph and superimposed them on top of the uh, prophet. And, you know, I had to, I just, all I did was resize and there was a little bit of, um, of horizontal shifting that I had to do to get them to, to fit, but they, they fit exactly. And, and you can see that they're character for character, um, exactly the same thing. And on the third line, here's the little change. You'll notice that the uh, printer rotated the last block 180 degrees. Well, actually, in the in the newspaper, it was um, 90 degrees rotated already. So, so they only rotated it 90 degrees the wrong direction, an easy mistake to make. But I believe the stick of Joseph and the prophet characters were printed using the exact same print blocks because there's there's no way that you would pay for for people to do this twice and they're so they're <laughs> they align so well. They've they've got to be off of the same blocks. That's my that's my conclusion. And the final set of uh, characters in the stick of Joseph are upside down and backwards. They've been rotated 180 degrees. And um, because the be well, there's there's a couple of reasons why I believe that the um, that the error is in the in the stick of Joseph. And, and one of them is because the, the prophet actually corresponds to the uh, Whitmer characters without the, without the rotation. And the other reason is this, um, the, the first line in the, in the stick of Joseph, you'll notice the last character here, uh, it wouldn't have fit in the margins that were dictated by the um, by the size of the tray that they were in, and so they've taken that last character and put it on a second line, and they put this fancy um, border around it to to indicate that that was from the same line. And when you look at uh, this one, you'll notice that that they've used the same plates. Um, they don't have exactly this, the same um, uh, horizontal spacing, but they put the put, they put the character down there. Uh, they just rotated all all of the all of the plates and did that. There's no reason in the newspaper that they couldn't have had a longer line because it was in the middle of uh, a number of lines of print. So that's my reason, my second reason for believing that the same plates were used. They just uh, rotated them and they made a printer's error when they, when they, uh, when they put the uh, stick of Joseph in. And that's gonna turn out to be important. Um, there are three characters in the prophet and the stick of Joseph that aren't in Whitmer and Hicks. 
And the three are these, uh, the last two on this first line, and then one in the second line. And um, some people have taken this as evidence that these are copies of an unknown source that, that um, you know, both, both Whitmer and, and the prophet uh, and the stick of Joseph were, were copied off of something else. However, if you look carefully, you'll see that there's a, a big difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the, um, of the, well, this is the Hicks photo, but, but um, it, it's true of, of the, um, the um, Whitmer document as well. And the, the right-hand side is extremely frayed. And I believe that that's because it had a longer edge. And if you look really carefully, you can see that this is, this is, this wasn't just a piece of paper that's back there. It's, I believe it's part of this, um, this document that was folded underneath that this, this was folded. And, um, and, and you can see that the line would have gone farther. And if you put these in the same, uh, the same size, they would fit very easily on that line. And then, um, Notice that the straighter left edge may indicate that it was stored in a closed book. I have all kinds of, of test papers that I put into a book and uh, they stayed on my shelf for several years and got moved around and, and the top edge is really frayed and the bottom is really straight. And uh, that, that's what it looks like to me. Now, there are other people who have written other explanations for, for, the, uh, for, the, for the look of these, but I've never seen anybody that actually talked about, about these characters. Um, this particular character on the second row looks just like the one to its right. It's not complete, but it looks like it's to its right. And uh, on the original, you'll notice that there's an L here and there's an L here, and that was a copy mistake and the, the original, they copied, they caught it and they erased it or tried to erase it, tried to get rid of it, but you can still see where the L was. And the reason is that, that these things were being written with a quill pen probably, and they had to dip their pen and it's easy to lose your place. And um, you're copying a whole bunch of strange characters and you could get this, you could make a mistake like that very, very easily. So my reason for saying all this is that explaining these three characters, in my opinion, does not require an unknown source. Some people say there must be, but I don't, uh, I don't see why there would have to be. And I would uh, like to go with the simplest explanation if I, if I could find a simple explanation. The next one that we're gonna look at is um, Eva Grace Smith Madison print. And um, these are two sides of this um, piece of paper, this, this photograph. And um, Eva Grace was the sixth child of Alexander Hale Smith. And the photo was by the FC Warnke Art Studio. And the Warnke's Art Studio opened in Independence in 1879. And Eva died in 1882 at the age of 19. So we know that the, that the uh, photograph was taken uh, between 1879 and, and 1882. That doesn't tell you when the original of this was, was made, however. And um, so the question that some have raised is, did the Anton transcript look like that? And once again, we'll do a comparison here. And I'm just, you could compare starting with the first character there and the first character here, you would see that they character by character are the same, but let's do the last line of the, of the um, stick of Joseph. And the stick of Joseph is on the right in the, in the brown and F, uh, 
the the print is on the the left in white. So so here you have the two closed parents and a and a mask, whatever. Um, there's there's a better explanation for that, but I'll just uh, gloss over that for right now. You can see that these characters are the same in the same order in the same uh, the same type of character, uh, very closely matched. And here you see that we have it goes character by character. These are the same things. And in particular, the Eva Grace print contains every character of the Stick of Joseph, including the rotated printer's error. And that shows that it is it certainly was made after 1844. We can say with great confidence it's a copy of the Stick of Joseph made after 1844 and not the original Anthon transcript. The next ones are Anthon and Hoffman. This is, this is Professor Anthon from, um, from New York. And um, you can go on, on, uh, on the internet and you can find several portraits of him. But in, in the book, Mormonism Unveiled in 1834, uh, Anthon said this about Martin Harris's visit. He said, this paper, the paper that Martin Harris gave him consisted of all kinds of crooked characters disposed in columns and had evidently been prepared by some person who had before him at the time, a book containing various alphabets, Greek and Hebrew letters, crosses and flourishes, Roman letters inverted or placed sideways were arranged and placed in perpendicular columns and the whole ended in a rude delineation of a circle divided into various compartments decked with various strange marks and evidently copied after the Mexican calendar given by Humboldt. So Mark Hoffman uh, came up with this uh, document it looks like Anton's description. It has columns and it ends with a circular thing. It was sold to the Mormon church in 1980 by Mark Hoffman for $20,000 plus uh, some documents. It's known to have been produced by Hoffman. There's a whole book about it. Uh, if you want an interesting read, it's called Salamander. Actually, there's more than one book about it, but uh, this one in Salamander, they actually go through all of the documents that uh, Mark Hoffman uh, forged and um, show how, how they tested them and, and uh, various things. The ink was dated after 1900 um, in the end. And there were three other tests that they gave that were positive for forgeries. We also have Hoffman's confession and um, and this is this is a fascinating story, and it's a little bit to the it's a little bit of a sidelight, but I hope you won't mind. I to me it's it's so fascinating. I, I just can't can't um, pass it by. This is Mark Hoffman. Looks like the all American guy. He was a Mormon missionary over in England, um, and this is the prosecutor, Mr. Stott. And you can go online and get, there's two volumes of his confession. I've only read the 50 pages that have to do with this particular, um, with this particular document. Let's go to the Anton transcript. Can you tell us how it was that you came up with this idea? Answer, I read a description of the transcript which Charles Anton gave, which does not match obviously the known character page which the RLDS church has. Question, what was your thinking from there? Answer, well, I probably can't be lucky enough to find it, so why can't I make it? Question, you wanted to make some changes from the characters that were in the Whitmer transcript. What was your idea and why did you go about it that way? Answer, I wanted the chronology to appear that the Whitmer transcript came from this copy. I made it appear as though the broadside version and the copy in the newspaper called The Prophet came from another copy that is unknown, which originated from my copy. 
I tried to make it so that the Whitmer transcript came directly from my copy as far as the detailed changes or whatever. So here to the right, I have an example. The characters in Whitmer and the Stick of Joseph uh, differ. And here's Hoffman's version that differs a little bit from both of them. You, the bottom has a closed loop like the Whitmer character and the top is, um, is a little bit ambiguous. It could be either one. We'll see more examples of that. Question, how did you go about deciding what to do as far as making changes in each specific character? Answer, in some of the characters, I added details which did not appear in others. That is the way they trace the chronology of that sort of thing. So here you see Whitmer and the Stick of Joseph, a particular character. And in Hoffman's, you have a closed loop, which doesn't occur in either one. And you also have a rounded base, which doesn't occur in either one. And so he's saying, well, mine is more carefully made. So, and it has more detail. So these were um, copies that weren't, just weren't done as well. Question, did you add together some of the characters or did you take apart some of the characters? Answer, I did both. I believe that the Hoffman version, it's drawn with more care and does not look like it was taken from the Whitmer transcript, but rather the Whitmer was taken from it because it has more details, the way the characters are grouped. So here you have a sequence of four characters in Whitmer, the same character, four characters in the Stick of Joseph which are actually very close together, but uh, Hoffman does it this way. He takes the, the seven and rotates it 180 degrees. He leaves the carrot the way it is. That's a C-A-R-E-T, carrot. Uh, he puts the T in there so you can barely see it. And then he puts the uh, filled square and he makes one character out of the whole, out of the whole bunch. He puts them together and um, says, well, those were, those were copied from this somehow. Here's another example. Uh, this, here's one where the Whitmer and the Stick of Joseph differ quite a bit, but he takes the, the V from, from uh, Whitmer. He turns the coil 180 degrees here, and he takes the uh, upside down U, I would say intersection, but uh, upside down U from, from the stick of Joseph and puts them together and you have this um, this character right here. The horizontal line here is is the crease in the paper as it wasn't uh, something that he drew. Here's another interesting one. Uh, Whitmer and again the stick of Joseph look a little bit different. Um, so and what he did was he took the nine here and he puts it on the left he puts the circle, keeps it in the middle, puts the six on the right, adds a little bit of uh, symmetry, and you've got this pretty little flower arrangement that he that comes up on Hoffman. A final a final example from from Whitmer, uh, you have the uh, the closed parent here. And then you have the open pair in there. And then you have this angle. And he was very, the, the forgery is very precise on angles. Uh, I didn't change a thing to get that, to get that angle there. And then uh, the three with the dot, you can see it there. And so Hoffman uh, renders that sequence uh, this way. Then there's the Stick of Joseph character. And here he uh, separates the two lines. He keeps these parallel and they are parallel and they're in the same ratio of, of size. They're not, they're not in the same position, but they're in the same ratio of size. And he puts that one and, um, and keeps, that, keeps that parallel to what it was. Question, did you use all of the characters in the Whitmer or the broadside or what? Do you remember? 
Answer, I believe that all the characters on the Whitmer document have a corresponding character on the Hoffman transcript. The broadside and the newspaper versions do not have as many characters. They're an abridged version. So some characters are modified. You've seen the modifications, but with those modifications, the first row of Whitmer is the first column of Hoffman. And the second row and the second column, the third row and the third column, the fourth row and the fourth column. Then the fifth row, he splits into three pieces. Two of them are there and one of them's right here at the top of the circle. He had a couple of characters left over. Uh, and then it, some of them are a little bit indistinct on Hoffman. He kind of mushed them in here, but uh, you can follow the, the uh, thing if you, if you care to if you care to take the time to do that. So virtually every sequence on Whitmer can be identified on, on Hoffman. And um, the next question, the Zodiac, the circular figure, where did that come from? My imagination. Question, how did your decision to place inside the circles the characters? What was your reasoning there? Well, I had a bunch of characters left over from the Whitmer transcript. I tried to get in and I crammed them in there. And he really did. Uh, the inner circle is divided into four sections horizontally. There were three horizontal lines. You can see them if you look very, very closely. And uh, did you try to keep the characters in the circle in some kind of order? Yes, they're in the same basic sequence as the Whitmer transcript. And, and I've just showed you how they, how they come out. With the last character on the Whitmer transcript being on the horizontal rectangle at the bottom of the circle, it looks like something like an upside down V. And if you look real close, you can see that um, circled there. Question, do you remember, are there any characters that occur maybe in the placard that don't in the Whitmer or vice versa? I may have added a character or two. Again, it would have been to make the Hoffman transcript look more complete or earlier in the sequence. And here are those last two characters. You can see them at the bottom of Hoffman's first column. And then you have that conglomerate that I showed you. And then these, um, he split this into two pieces there. Um, the I beam and the superscript H or whatever that is uh, are clearly visible here. Again, the horizontal line on Hoffman is the is the um, the fold in the paper. This is this is clearly the same. You've got nine vertical slashes. You've got an an over bar with an upturn at the right, and you have a little. Um, uh, I think it's a tally line here. They were they were keeping track of how many they had, and they put five. You can see the little tally line if you look really really close on Hoffman. And it ends with what I call the double ears here. And then there's, a, then there's a six to end it off. So the whole sequence is there. Mark Hoffman designed his document to look like the Anton's transcript. He used every Whitmer character, although he altered many. He preserved the basic sequences of Whitmer. And he employed extra characters from the stick of Joseph, including the printer's error. And if I, a number of people have written about the upside down backwards um, uh, things, but they didn't recognize it as a printer's error, at least at the time. And so they, they bought the Hoffman uh, forgery. The purpose that Mark said he did it for, he was to convince the experts that his document was the real Anton transcript that Whitmer was copied directly and that the prophet and the stick of Joseph descended from Hoffman as well. The fact that Hoffman's forgery incorporates the 1844 printer's error shows that it does not represent the real Anton transcript. So the final one is Berger. And um, Recently, Mauricio Berger from Brazil claimed these plates were used by Joseph Smith to translate the Book of Mormon. The characters are arranged in columns and end in a circular figure. And everybody agrees that these characters from Hoffman 
up here on burger and these characters do as well and in the same order and these characters do in the same order these characters do in the same order and these characters do in the same order these columns from hoffman and burger are virtually identical and in particular you have the stick of joseph rotated sequence here the printer's error here's hoffman's rendering of it and right there is uh, you didn't see that right there is Berger's uh, rendering. You can see these characters. He doesn't have the whole thing there, uh, but he doesn't have anything in the in the top space here. But from from the nine vertical slashes on, you've got the nine vertical slashes with the over bar. You've got the double ears. You've got the six, and you've got a little extra. Um, dash that Hoffman just put in there that wasn't any wasn't from any place else. So my summary is the stick of Joseph and the prophet both contain identical copies of Whitmer's first three rows except for the printer's error. These were these are both known to have been printed in 1844. All other known sources with claims of Anthon characters contain the printer's error. And therefore these originated after 1844, Eva Grace, Hoffman and Berger. Thus Whitmer stands alone as the only possibility for the real Anton transcript. And I'm not saying that it is the real Anton transcript. I'm just saying there isn't any other contender. But you still have the problem of the rows versus columns and so I've got a little PS here uh, on rows versus columns. And I'd like to look at Joseph Smith's description of the writing on the plates. Here's what he says in his own handwriting. The language of the whole, that's talking about the, uh, the writing on the Book of Mormon on plates, running the same as all Hebrew writing in general. And Hebrew writing in general is arranged in rows and it's read from right to left. So Joseph said that what was on the plates was in rows by inference here. And if you look at Hicks, this is kind of interesting. Um, this title, the book of, you'll see the of goes off the page. And so there was something, I believe there was something after that. Some have said, well, this is the book of generation of Adam or, or something like that, which uh, there's a whole paper on that. But um, it looks to me like the book of goes off the page and it was a bigger page and we don't have that, that piece on it. Um, but if it had a horizontal title, English like this, then you'll notice that the Book of Mormon characters are in perpendicular columns. And what are perpendicular columns? Perpendicular has to be perpendicular to something. And I believe that maybe it was perpendicular to the title that was on the page. And if you turn it this way and you look at it, you'll see a number of things that look like Roman characters that are sideways. Here you have a U, capital U. Here you have a capital Q for those of you who, are, who know uh, cursive writing. Here you have a little T, a little L, a, little, a big T, an H, a B, and there's, there's several others that look like Roman letters that are now sideways. And so Anton's remembrance that Roman letters were inverted or placed sideways and they were arranged and placed in perpendicular columns is entirely plausible if this was what the if this was the Anton transcript. In 1834, Anton says the whole ended in a rude delineation of a circle divided into various compartments decked with various strange marks and evidently copied after the Mexican calendar given by Humboldt. Well, this is the Mexican calendar given in Humboldt's book, Humboldt's Aztec calendar. And um, there were only 150 of these books that were printed in English and Columbia College, I went to their librarian on the internet and asked them when they got theirs. They got their copy in 1960. So they didn't, 
have, they probably didn't have a copy of this book back in uh, 1828. I'm thinking that uh, this is the one significant detail of Anton's description that does not jibe with the Whitmer transcript. And Anton's memory on this point may have been faulty as he may have seen both about the same time and both are filled with strange characters. So that's my, that's my only explanation. I was, I was hoping to find something that Anton could have looked at in newspapers of the day or, or something, but I, I, I failed on that point. But the Whitmer characters came from somewhere. And Mary Jo Yackel has identified over 40 demotic Egyptian words with meanings consistent with a Book of Mormon context in her book, Characters Unlocked. And here's how they start. The first row here begins with M, R. This is M with an N down below, which is quite common. And then there's an N below that, which is a personal pronoun like I, me, or my, and, and they didn't use vowels and they spelled out names and this would be I, Mormon. And the next one is ask, pray, or petition. These, these words and, and the symbols that go with them are, are found in actual Mayan, usually Mayan German dictionaries that were uh, that were made, and Mary Jo hunted up the hunted up the characters and looked up the looked up the uh, the words that went with them. The next one is the or this. The next one is spirit. The next one is another. The next one is power and authority. Now Mary Jo has not attempted to translate these, but she has identified all of these words which, which could be put into a translation. And we can talk about that if there's enough time, but there's, there's not very much time. So I'll just leave it with that. Um, here are 40 words that she has identified and in her book and uh, the characters that, that go with them. So, in, in summary, all known copies, real or fake, I believe descended from Whitmer. I think there's very good reason to, to believe that. Whitmer may itself be a copy of the real Anton transcript or it might be the real Anton transcript. We don't know. The layout of the Whitmer characters is consistent with Joseph Smith's description of Book of Mormon writing. And the fact that Whitmer characters appear to form genuine demotic Egyptian words with meanings consistent with the Book of Mormon context is hard evidence that they were copied and not made up. And that is my presentation. What man? <laughs> Questions or anything? Nice job. <laughs> yeah, that was excellent. Thank you. Just one thing. Uh, you did say she took from Mayan uh, German, but it was demotic, not Mayan. I, I'm sorry. I'm so, I, yes. Yeah, I, I knew what you were doing. I apologize. I apologize. Yes, that was that was. I just wanted to make that clear for listeners that yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. My my, my bad there. Thank hey, that's okay. I can understand it because she studied that first and realized it wasn't Mayan and then right. went to the right. It was demotic Egyptian. Yeah. If it's not mine, that means it's yours. Yeah, right. <laughs>